Johnny Tremaine, chapter 12, A Man Can Stand Up. This is our last chapter, and before we dive in, I just want to thank you all. Thank you to my students in my class at Hojo Academy. You guys are doing awesome. Thanks for joining me. And then also those that are just joining through YouTube, just want to tell you all, I'm, you know, I'm proud of you guys for, for reading and following along, staying on top of your schoolwork, and even some of you that haven't enjoyed reading, you're doing awesome to get your work done and, and staying on top and doing your best. I really appreciate everybody in my class and all those that are watching for joining me on this fun journey of reading Johnny Tremaine. So let's now get into our last and final chapter, chapter 12. By insignificant black back alleys and little trod lanes, Johnny made his way to the ferry slip in North Boston. From there to Charlestown, boats were going back and forth. The wounded were taken off first. No civilian except only the Boston doctors who had offered their services were allowed close to the wharf. It was well Johnny had thought to put on Pumpkin's uniform. Mrs. Bessie had been right about one thing. A Yankee caught impersonating a British soldier would be shot. He kept well out of the moonlight and away from the flare of torches, and huddled between a warehouse and a tanning shed. His uniform said he was a private in the 4th Regiment, the King's own. Pumpkin had not been big and bold enough for a gren grenadier, nor clever enough for a light infantryman, just a simple foot soldier. Obviously, a foot soldier on the 4th would have left Boston that morning with Percy, would have mucked about for 12 hours, shooting and being shot at, and he would not already be back in Boston unless he had been wounded. The smartness of the uniform, which at first had delighted him, he now saw was a danger. He lay down and rolled in the muck of the tanning shed, tore his jacket on a nail and pulled off a button. The black and silver that hat he stamped on banged out of shape and pulled on well over his eyes. He put mud on his face, pricked his wrist, and smeared his cheek with blood. Then he stepped out on the wharf. An officer who had been in town all day moved up to him. Johnny saluted. Wounded? Not much, sir. Well, better report to the medical officers. They are using that house as a temporary, hosp temporary hospital. Others are worse off then. I, I'll wait till the bad ones have been tended to. That's the spirit. How was the fighting? Very heavy, sir. Can those damn Yankees shoot straight? Johnny had been around the regulars enough to know that was a question that should be answered by oaths in spite of Mr. Lapham's training. The officer laughed and moved down the wharf. Although no townsmen except only the doctors were permitted on the wharf, Johnny knew that hundreds of them stood well back in a darkness, gloating. They were not saying much, only watching. Then one man began to whistle, and the next took it up, and the next and the next. The whistling was shrill as a fife. They had not forgotten the prophecy of that morning. They go out by Yankee Doodle, but they'll dance it to it before nightfall. Yankee Doodle filled the darkness as the eerie shrilling of the ha Hylas fill black swamps in spring. Four more boats were coming in. Johnny dared move out onto the wharf, but he still kept well in shadow. More wounded. Could these be the very men who had started out so confidently? Uh, bed raggled, dirty, torn uniforms, torn flesh, lost equipment, faces ghastly with fatigue and pain. Some were twisting and crying out. The first two boats were filled with privates. They had been packed in, and now were being tossed ashore like so much cordwood. Most of them were pathetically good and patient, but he saw an officer strike a man who was screaming. Johnny's hands clenched. It is just as James Otis said, he thought. We are fighting partly for just that, because a man as a private is no reason he should be treated like cordwood. The third boat was moving in with a creak of oarlocks, and he heard an exclamation, Colonel Smith! There were only two wounded in this boat, for both were officers. Getting the fat colonel up and off the bottom of the dory was heavy work. He was rolled upon a stretcher and carried to the hospital. He had been shot through the leg. Johnny had never seen Colonel Smith except when he was rosy, with good brandy, pompous with pride in himself, and the men he commanded. Now he was tallow-colored and as deflated as a pricked bladder. The other officer crawled off unaided. The torch suddenly lighted his face, a dark young face. His lips locked to keep down and cry of pain. One arm and a bloody sling. Rab, oh, Rab, of course not. It was Lieutenant Stranger. Instinctively, Johnny started forward to help him, for everyone else was so busy with the wounded colonel. Stranger was left at the shift for himself. The boy thought in time of his own danger. How curious a thing is war. Last week, no, yesterday, this man was, in a way, his friend. Lieutenant Stranger walked stiffly in an agony toward the hospital. And then another boat, more wounded, the sight of them sickened Johnny. Gray and twisted lips, hollow eyes. 
but I can't leave. I've got to stay about. Watch my chance for a ride over. Next, what was left of Colonel Smith's command began to arrive. They had been marching and much of the time under fire for 24 hours. They had gone without food or water. As the men stumbled off the boats, there were plenty of questions and answers. Johnny would not be able to tell Dr. Warren the exact number of casualties the British had suffered, suffered, but he could tell them that they thought they were heavy. The very last man of Colonel Smith's command to return was Major Pitcairn. His face still looked cheerful and confident. They had been licked, and they... Sorry, they had been licked, had they? All right, the tough old Marine had been licked before. As he stepped ashore, suddenly the soldiers about the ferry slipped but began to cheer. Let's get back at him, Major, they yelled. He grinned and struck, stuck out his jaw. We'll take another try, he said, and if next time we don't clean up on those, he went off into the profanity for which he was famous to describe what he thought of their enemies, and a roar went up from the men. Now Johnny learned that the bulk of Percy's brigade would be left over in Charlestown, camped on Bunker Hill until the next morning. Johnny believed the time had come for him to act. The sailors from one of the boats were standing about arguing whether or not they were supposed to go to the Somerset for the night or over to Charlestown. Johnny ran up to them. I have a message for Earl Percy. He was breathing hard from the excitement, but I might have come from running. Get me over quick, boys. Oh, you go whistle for General, said one of them. You go whistle for your mama. We're sailors, not soldiers, see? Just let me take your boat. That's your regular. Well, I've got to get over and I can't swim, can I? You asked Lieutenant Swift. He's in charge of us. The last thing Johnny wanted was to be questioned by an officer. Will you or won't you take me across? Now without orders, you little wabbler. What's up, man? A quiet voice asked. The sailor saluted. This here baby boy says he's got a message for old Percy. He wants us to row him over. Then you will do so. Aye, aye, sir. Nobody asked to see Johnny's letter. Johnny was rowed across and landed at a wharf in Charlestown. Quickly he slipped up a cobbled street turned into a garden, stripped off his uniform, and hung it on a clothesline. He found a pump and washed his face. Although past midnight lights showed in all but the abandoned houses, the people of Charlestown were in panic. They dared not go to bed with over a thousand British soldiers suddenly camped upon them, defeated soldiers whose mood might turn ugly. These soldiers only wanted to be left alone, allowed to sleep, but the inhabitants thought they might butcher them all. Johnny glanced in at two or three taverns. British officers were sleeping in chairs, on benches, on the floors. But he remembered that one of the tavern keepers was a prominent son of liberty. There he tiptoed in among the sleeping guests, found a nine-year-old girl servant hidden behind a flower barrel in the pantry and got her to lead him to the summer house where the tavern keeper and his wife had moved for the night. From the tavern keeper he learned for the first time what happened after the skirmish at Lexington. Colonel Smith had indeed marched on the Concord, possessed the town, destroyed such military stores as had not yet been hidden, and there had been another skirmish. You might even call it a battle at North Bridge. But from everywhere, all about, had come the Minutemen. Obviously, Smith had been a little afraid of leaving the safety of the village. He would wait where he was for the re reinforcements he had sent for, even before Lexington. But Percy did not come and did not come. Sorry. But Percy did not come and did not come. Every moment, more and more Minutemen were arriving, surrounding the village. At noon, Smith had decided to try to take his men back. He dared wait no longer. Then the shooting began. The Minutemen, from behind stone walls and barns, trees, bushes, had opened fire. Beaten and bloody, almost in a panic, Colonel Smith's troops struggled through to Lexington. Not until then did Percy's reserves arrive. If they had not come, every one of Smith's command would have been killed. And from Lexington, the British had drawn back to uh, Minotomy. Uh, Minotomy. And from there, the wounded Scarlet Dragon had crawled over Charleston Common, crossed into safety at Charleston Neck, and were covered by the Somerset's guns. And here they were. They had been badly beaten. What of Dr. Warren? He had been everywhere, one moment fighting and dressing the wounds the next. He had fought like a wildcat, but the innkeeper had no idea where he was now. He didn't get hurt? I'm told he had a lock of hair shot away. He came that close to death. Have you, by any chance, heard how it fared with the men of Lexington? I believe seven or eight of them were killed in the first volley. Do you know their names? No, but by the time the British got back to Lexington from Concord, the Lexington men were ready for them, and they fit them and harried them all the way to Charlestown. Johnny knew he had no chance of leaving Charlestown until the few hundred fresh men who had been rowed over to the hold of the neck had been withdrawn. Next morning he watched them go and waited ch this chance. It was ten o'clock when he left the town. People were running about. Each had a story to tell. Many women, children, and timid folk had spent the night hidden in the clay pits. They, too, were coming out of hiding. Johnny, from sheer high spirits, jumped the, the now-deserted breastwork, 
breastwork the British had thrown up so hastily the night before. He had seen so much of the British army he had come half to believe that they were, even as they said, invincible. No Yankee farmers could stand up to them. He had been impressed with their perfection of equipment, discipline, grand gaudy uniforms, the pride of their officers. We beat them. We Yankees did. God was with us. He took the road for Cambridge, crossing desolate Charlestown Common with its salt marshes, clay pits, gallows, and gibbet. Everywhere he saw signs of the tree, the heavy tracks of cannon. The road itself beat into muck under anxious feet. He saw lost hats, uniforms, muskets even, and he saw a group of men getting a horse out of a pit. The horse was taking the matter sensibly, not struggling, seeming to understand that the oxen being tackled would pull him out. It was Colonel Smith, Sandy. Johnny looked upon this as a good omen and walked forward whistling, but his whistling stopped abruptly. He ab ab abruptly, he had met his first uh, burial party. Um, burial party. Um, he noted the faces of the men and women following the dead countrymen. Next, he saw a cellar hole with smoke and stench still rising from it. There was a tavern. In the tap room, men sat about drinking rum and boasting of their great deeds. Johnny did not doubt, but they had all done as well as they said. But he was in no mood to listen. So having brought, bought bread, a handful of salt, alewives, and asked if anyone knew where Dr. Warren was, he quickly left. They told him to try Cambridge. Here a strange thing had happened, apparently overnight. Milling about were hundreds upon hundreds, perhaps thousands of Minutemen. They had come as they were from the plow, the shop, even from the pulpit. Most of them had guns in their hands, but there were hardly a dozen overcoats among them. No blankets. They had no food except the little their woman had tied up for them, enough to take a man through one day's fighting. No tents, no extra, no extra munitions. What now was to be done with them? What were they to do with themselves? Should they go home now? having accomplished the mission for which they had been summoned, or were they to stay and undertake the siege of Boston? They had no cannon, seemingly had nothing but the guns in their hands and the fire in their hearts. The man who told Johnny he was a colonel, he did have a pair of homemade epaulets sewed to his old hunting shirt, said that, said that the committee of safety was sitting at the Hastings house, trying to work out some way these civilians might be turned into soldiers. Dr. Warren was chairman of this committee. Johnny went to the Hastings house where he met Paul Revere. He told him Dr. Warren had left Lex Lexington. Lexington? It was to Lexington of all places in the world Johnny wanted to go. Now he had an excuse for it. This day, like the one before, was warm and beautiful. It was one of those silent, dreamy spring days when sunshine pours down upon the yet cold earth and the earth turns into in its sleep. No cloud in the sky, not one cat's paw of breeze. He stepped along rapidly. Not until he reached Minatomi was he once again following the tracks of the defeated British army. A parcel of folk were standing about a stout old grand maid. Six gr grenadiers had surrounded to her and asked for her protection. She had no idea the battle was moving in so close. Old Mother Batherick had been out digging dandelions. In every house left standing, Johnny saw bullet holes and once again a, bur a burial party. Twelve men hastily thrown upon an, an ox shed, sorry, an ox sled, were being drawn to their single grave, and there were British dead to bury. Where should they be buried? The minister said they were to be laid in the lot set aside for slaves. But all who had hats doffed them as friend and foe passed by. Johnny had no hat, but he stood with bowed head. He walked on. The sight of a young woman drawing water was too much for him. He stopped and asked her for a drink. As he sat on a wall and drank from a wooden bucket, she answered his questions. Was he now in Lexington? Yes, he had crossed the town line. Those Lexington men, how many were killed on the green yesterday? Eight, she said. As he asked his next question, his voice sounded unreal to himself. Happens you know their names? She turned a stony face and stared at him. These are their names, she said. Let them never be forgot. She stretched out her hands and counted her fingers. Jonathan Harrington, she said, and Caleb too. Robert, Mon Robert Monroe, Jonas Parker, Samuel Headley, Isaac Muzzy, Nathaniel Wyman, John Brown. Rabs was not one. Johnny smiled. Do you know how the Silsbys fared? She said the women and children had, like so many others, gone away to hide. She believed they had gone to Woburn, but now they might be back again at Silsby's Cove. And the men went out fighting? Of course, all except Grandshire. Grandsire, he wouldn't hide with the women and farm animals, and he couldn't go fight. He was sought on sitting under his own roof. Then Johnny went on his way, passing Monroe Tavern, and where Percy had joined Colonel Smith, 
he could see the marks of the cannon and the destruction they caused. So he was in the village. The first thing he noticed as he stood looking down at the green was that the old median house had been knocked into a cocked hat by a cannonball. So late in the afternoon of the gentle April day, Johnny came down upon Lexington Green. The smashed median house with its tiny wooden belfry was before him. Buckman Tavern was to his right. The green itself was laced over with the shadows of new leaves. It was here the men had stood. Here upon this green, they had formed a thin, pathetic line, a handful of farmers to resist the march of 700 British regulars. Here they had died. Oh, it was so hopeless and so brave you might laugh. You might cry. The inside of Johnny's nose began to prick, and he brushed his arm across his face. But it was his duty to find Dr. Warren, not to stand gawking at the little battlefield. Thus far, he had no luck at all in locating the doctor. But at last, his luck turned. He recognized his chase, and that rabbit ear little pacing mare of the doctor's hitched before the Harrington house. The doctor was standing on the steps, and about him were a group of women, all crying. Johnny knew why. Jonathan Harrington wounded in the skirmish, had been able to drag himself thus far to his own house and die upon that threshold. Dr. Warren was leaving them now. He had no hat but a bandage about his thick fair hair. The bullet had grazed his scalp. Johnny went up to him and handed him the list he had time to write down during the night at Charlestown. The doctor read it, nodded, and put it in his pocket. He was too tired to say much, but there was one question Johnny had to ask. Dr. Warren, and the Lexington men stood here, and the British over there and fired at them? I know the names of those who were killed, but when the British came back from Concord and the fight went on all the way to Charlestown and the Lexington men went after them, I don't know who was killed then. You are hunting for Rab? Yes, I've got to find him. Nobody seems able to tell me. I'll tell you, Johnny. Tired as he was and uh, uh, surfeited with the sight of blood and suffering, he broke the news as best he could. Rab stood here, just about where we are standing now. He did not go when Mr. Major Pitcairn told him to disperse. He kept on standing with the other men, his musket in his hands. Johnny could see him, clear as in the flesh, Rab standing unafraid in the cool gray of the earliest dawn, the musket in his hands, the look in his eyes, that fierce, sudden look. But after that, did Rab follow the British to Charlestown? No, he was wounded in the first volley. He got it pretty bad. You mean very bad, don't you? Yes, very. I see, but Johnny saw nothing. The fresh spring would turn black before him, but even in this darkness he could still see Rab, chin up, soldiers squared, not afraid. Where? he asked. He was carried to Buckman's Tavern. I saw him yesterday. I was about to go there now, but don't expect too much. No. Rab played a man's part. Look, look that you do the same. I will. He knew that doctor meant he wasn't to cry or take on. He got to take it quietly. Dr. Warren whistled to his mare who followed him like a dog. Johnny entered the tavern on Warren's heels, and to the right was the tap room, full and over full. Johnny half, heard, sorry, Johnny half heard the same conversation going on here that he had listened to when he had stopped to buy food at the other tavern. Had they all been heroes, or did they just talk and do nothing? Rab never had said much, but he had done all a man might. The boy had been carried to a back chamber on the second floor. He was not in bed, but sitting up in an armchair, propped with pillows. A woman of the inn had been sitting with him, quietly knitting. She got up when the doctor and Johnny entered the room and left without speaking. Johnny had been fearful that Rab would be suffering, crying out, struggling like other wounded men he had seen, afraid that with death so close something of that aloof dignity he had always had would be shattered. He had lived with Rab a year and a half, and yet he had never really known him, not known him in inside it out, as, say, he had known the hated dove. But half sitting as he was, Rab did not seem at very, seem at first very different from always. His face was white but not drawn, the eyes very dark and wide. Rab smiled. You got all right? Yes. How's Boston? The British are furious that we licked them so. There was a sudden trickle of blood at one corner of his mouth. Rab wiped it away. In these few hours, his hands had grown white, weak, thin. And as he turned his face, the afternoon light fell across it. Johnny saw the flesh seem translucent. There were lavender circles around about the eyes. I had a lot, a lot of time to think, said Rabbit last. Just lying here. Do you remember that market woman who lost her pig? Its name was Myra, and it could do tricks. Then I looked up, and you were standing there, looking like a robber boy with your hand in your pocket. I remember. Rabbit lay with his eyes shut for a little while, rem remembering other things, things perhaps Johnny did not share. Back into his childhood in Lexington, the important and unimportant things jumbled together. A favorite dog, the death of his father, 
The first day he went to school and the first day he drilled with the Minutemen. He moved a little restlessly and said, Colonel Nusbit, remember? And he told me, go buy a pop gun, boy. Well, a pop gun would have done me just as well in the end. This idea fretted him a little. Dr. Warren wet a cloth in a basin of water and wiped his bloody mouth. There's my musket over there. It's better now than any they have. I was always kind of bothered to think I might have to stand up to them without a good gun in my hands. But I had it all right. He was thanking Johnny for getting it for him. But I never did get to fire it. They shot first. The trickle of blood became a stream. Dr. Warren was bending over him, holding his shoulders. Johnny walked disconsolately about the chamber. He looked about the, out the window. He picked up a pewter candlestick and examined the maker's mark. He heard Warren saying, Steady boy, and after a moment, Is it better so? It is better so, Rab whispered. But the next moment he said quietly, quite naturally, Johnny. Johnny went to him, sat on the floor beside his chair, and put his hands over Rab's thin ones. Yes, Rab? You can have that musket. I sort of like to think of its going on. I put a better stock on it. Change the angle of the steel. Look at the flat, that flint. The one it had was too smooth. I've napped it. I'll take good care of it. And there's another thing you can do for me. Anything. Go to Silsby's Cove. See if the women have come back yet from hiding. Grandsire will be about. He said he wouldn't go off hiding. He'd sit it out in his chair. I'll go. Then Rab began to smile. Everything he had never put in words was in that smile. But as he was leaving the room, Johnny saw that once more Dr. Warren was bending over him. He heard him say, Is that better? Is it better? Or sorry, how is that? Is it better? Yes, it is better so. At Silsby's Cove, there were no women, children on, or farm animals about, except a couple of weaned calves in the calf pasture. When the warming morning came, it had probably been decided they were too hard to catch and cart. Johnny looked at the deserted barn. Hens were about. They could live for days on the spilled oats and rye. There were two dogs who came up to him, telling him they had not been fed. I'll bet they took you with them, said Johnny, and you sneak back home, eh, boys? The cat stuck close to him. It was a big orange tom, and Johnny knew it was Grandsire's favorite. It was meowing and rubbing about him. He picked it up. You wouldn't be bothered to go out and catch a mouse in the barn like other cats, would you? He said. But if Grandsire had not gone away to hide like the other non-combatants, he wondered why he had not fed the animals. He entered the old house, which was unlocked. The Tom, confident that now he would be fed in the elegant way he was accustomed to, began to knead his paws and his purring grew hoarse with triumph. Grandsire, Johnny called. There was no answer. In the red armchair, where the old gentleman usually sat since his game leg had got grown so bad, was empty. Major Silsby was not there. Johnny went to the larder and found bread and sour, more, sour milk for the animals. He welcomed the, the small duty. It kept him from thinking. The tom he fed in the kitchen, the basin of food for the dogs he put in the yard. Where, where was the old gentleman? Suddenly he had an idea, and he ran back into the kitchen and looked over the hearth. Grandsire's old gun was gone, and so was the powder horn he had carried to Lewisburg back in 1745. And so was Grandsire Silsby. Johnny walked back to the village his head bent and his hands in his pockets. A numbness, half emotional, half physical, was stealing up through him. His feet felt like lead. His mind seized upon little trivial things, like that orange tomcat of Grandsire Silsby's. He noticed a jubilant little girl with a grenadier bearskin bear hat on her head, half over her face. He could not help but notice the regimental number on the cap. The grenadier, likely dead by now, had been a soldier of the 10th. He saw Dr. Warren's chase before Buckman's tavern. In the lower entry, Dr. Warren was waiting for him. Rab? The doctor dropped his eyes. Sometime. He said, we will know how to stop bleeding like that. We don't know. He sent me away because he knew he had to die. Yes, he knew. Dr. Warren moved into the empty parlor of the inn, away from the noisy group in the tap room, telling over and over of the great deeds. There's no need for you to go upstairs. Johnny nodded. He had moved off into a strange, lonely world where nothing could seem real, not even Rab's death. The woman of the inn came in on tiptoe. She had a tray of food for the doctor. Tired out, the young man sank into a chair, his fair bandage aching head in his hands. You remember that night, he said? That last meeting of the observers, James Otis came, although we didn't want him. I can't remember much of what he said, but I remember how his words made the goose skin on my arms. I'll never forget it, he said, so a man could stand up. Yes, and some of us would die, so other men could stand up on their feet like men. 
A great many are going to, going to die for that. They have in the past. They will 100 years from now. 200. God grant there will always be good men good enough. Men like Rab. The quiet woman came in again. She had tossed up an omelet for the doctor and silently put it before him. Will you go up and fetch down the musket from the back chamber? He asked her. She nodded and did as he asked. Dr. Warren began to eat as doctors will, even under greatest strain. Can't you eat, boy? Not yet. Try and get some sleep. No. Johnny was on his feet, pacing about the room. He was too stunned to feel much now. Later, he thought, tomorrow next day, then I'll know that Rab is dead, but it can't hurt me now. But next year, all my life. His eye caught on the musket. He took it up, holding it close to the light of the window, fingering and examining it to see those improvements Rab said he had made on it. Rab had not taken one shot with it on Lexington Green. Never had a chance. Dr. Warren was standing beside him. Johnny, put down that gun. Here by this window, lay your right hand down like that so. Johnny felt no more shame over his burned hand. He did as the doctor bade him. He felt the cool, clean hands bending his fingers, twisting his thumb until he gritted his teeth. Johnny, that hand is not as bad as you think. Burned, was it? Yes. As you stood there holding that gun, it was the first time I've had a good look at it. Was it kept flat while he healing? No. I suppose your master called in some old herb woman to care for it. A midwife, yes. Bah, these midwives. Any doctor in Boston would have known. You see the thumb is pulled about like that, not because of any basic injury, but because of scar tissue. What do you mean? I mean that if you have the courage, I can cut through the scar tissue, free the thumb. My hand good and free once more? I can't promise too much. I don't know whether you can ever go back to your silver work, but not even Paul Revere is going to make much silver for a while. Will it be good enough to hold this gun? I think I can promise you that. The silver can wait. When can you, Dr. Warren? I've got the courage. I'll get some of these men in the tap room to hold your arm still while, op while I, I operate. No need. I can hold it still myself. The doctor looked at him with compassionate eyes. Yes, I believe you can. You go walk about in the fresh air while I get my instruments ready. Johnny stood upon the green and looked about him. He heard a woman calling, Chick, 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 from a nearby cow shed. He heard milk spurting into a pail. A tap of metal on <clears throat> a tap of metal on metal. His trained ear told him a gunsmith was at work. He could smell churned earth and gummy buds and sweet wood somewhere burning. His nostrils trembled. Almost could they almost could they recapture the gunpowder of yesterday. So fair a day now drawn into its close, green with spring, dreaming of the future, yet wet with blood. This was his land, and these his people. The cow that lowed the man who milked, the chickens that came running, and the woman who called them, the fragrance streaming from the plowed land and the plowman, these he possessed. The skillful hands of the unseen gunsmith were his hands. The old woman throwing stones at crows who cawed and derided her was his old woman, and they his crows. The wood smoke rising from the home hearths rose from his heart. He felt nothing could hurt him on this day, not Rab's death nor the surgeon's knife. He felt free, light, unreal, and utterly alone. Tomorrow, next day, it would be different, but today is today. Then far away, but coming nearer and nearer, down along uh, Minotami Road, he heard the throb of a drum, men coming back from Charlestown. He stood, turned his head to listen. The shuffle of feet, a fife began to toot. It was ill-played, maybe a foolish tune, but Johnny warned, warmed to hear it. For once, once more, Yankee Doodle was going to town. Everywhere else... Everywhere else in the village was silence. The music, small as the chirping of a cricket, filled that silence. Down the road came twenty or thirty tired and ragged men. Some were bloodstained, no uniforms. A curious arsenal of weapons. The long horizontal light of the sinking sun stuck into their faces and made them seem much alike. Then faced in the manner of Yankee men, high cheekbone, unalterably determined, the tired men marched unevenly. But Johnny noticed the swing of the lithe, independent bodies. The set of chin and soldiers Rab had been like that. Please God, out of this New England soil, such men would forever rise up, ready to fight when need came, the one generation after the other. Close on the heels of the marching men was an old chaise containing their commanding officer. For you couldn't get to fight on foot, you went on horseback. Sorry, for if you couldn't get to fight on foot, you went on horseback. And if not on horseback, you went in a chase. It was Grandsire Silsby with his old gun across his knees. Johnny started to run to him, to shout, Grandsire, Grandsire, you haven't heard yet, Rab is dead. But he knew the old major wouldn't stop. He had to get to his men to Cambridge and the siege of Boston. True, Rab had died, hundreds would die, but not the thing they died for, a man 
can stand up. The end. Just want to thank you guys all again for joining me. Hope you enjoyed John and Tremaine. I definitely did. Um, if you do have any questions about the book or your assignments for those that are in my class, uh, please just reach out to me on Canvas or in the comments below. You guys are awesome. Keep it up. I will see you guys in the next book.